Good evening, everyone. Welcome. My name is Claudia Morales with the Music Division, and I'm excited to welcome tonight So Percussion. Thank you for being here today. For over 20 years, So Percussion has redefined chamber music for the 21st century through an exterior blend of precision and anarchy, rigor and bedlam, the New Yorker. Their non such recording, Narrow Sea with Caroline Shaw, won the 2022 Grammy for Best Contemporary Classical Composition. In fall 2023, Sopra Casho began its 10th year as the Edward T. Cohn Performance in Residence at Princeton University. <laughs> we have some tigers here. <laughs> Rooted in the belief that music is an elemental form of human communication and galvanized by forces for social change, so pursues a range of social and community outreach through their nonprofit umbrella, so laboratories concert series, a studio residency program in Brooklyn, and the So Percussion Summer Institute. Very nice. So please welcome Eric Shaw Beach, Josh Quillen, Adams. Slowinski. <laughs> and Jason Truden. Can I say it right? All right. All right. Thank you. So I'm, I'm super excited to have you here tonight, and I have so many questions, and I mean, you, I'm sure you do too. But let's take it one step at a time. So you started almost around 1999, fresh out of college, Yale. Can you please take us back to that, those almost 20 years? How do you I know, guys more than it? 20 years, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, well, it actually, 1999 was the year that I, I got to Yale to study. So it even started a little bit in school, um, and we've changed a little bit over the years. <clears throat> this group of the four of us have been together for 16 years? We're going on 16? This is definitely, you know, the band. You know, early on, we, we, we changed a little bit. But all of us went through the Yale School Music Program, and there was a teacher there that uh, we were all excited to kind of learn from. Um, and I think we all went there because he was known as a soloist. This, this teacher, his name was Robert Van Seis. He was known as a soloist, and we were all, we thought we were interested in soloing, I guess, is why, is why I went there. And then you discovered really quickly that actually he was about chamber music. He was really teaching people to play together. Um, so 1999 was that first year, and then uh, 2000, I guess we had our first show where we had to name ourselves. Terrifying. Uh, we were just joking around today about the, the, the first name, um, was gonna be flipping coins. There was a moment that we were gonna be called flipping coins because <laughs> when, when, when we had to choose who was gonna play a certain part in a piece, we would flip coins. Or if you know, we were like, ah, oh, you know, I really think we should use the red mallet. No, we should use the green mallet. Ah, eh, whatever, let's just flip a coin. You know, that was the thing. Um, but luckily, we didn't name ourselves that. We named ourselves So Percussion. And then um, in 2001, we really started playing shows and, and moved to New York soon after that. And can you just talk to, can you speak about the name Saw? What does it mean? Yeah, I, I will speak about it, Claudia, and I will also point you to our website because um, my sister writes about it much more beautifully than I can speak about it. Um, and I say, um, her, her name is Janice Truding, and she lives in Japan, and when we were naming ourselves, it was terrifying. I don't know, has anybody had to name anything? You know, name a group, it's terrifying. Name a, it was, it was kind of scary. We were, well, obviously, flipping coins was where we were at, so we were in trouble. Um, and she suggested this word, so, which has Japanese roots and obviously also an English root as well. And the Japanese root, um, it comes from the, the kanji, the, the, the picture letter. And, and um, kind of if you were to, to draw it out, there's kind of two hands and the idea is that it's offering sound. And so a really kind of beautiful root to the word. Um, Friends of ours who are Japanese are like, I don't know if that's, you know, it feels like it's like old English, it's like a Latin root to an English word or something. It's like an old um, word in Japanese that's used in a lot of other Japanese words, um, such as inso or... So we imagine ourselves being named like ye old percussion exactly. group or something in the way that the Japanese think of that word. In Japanese we're named ye old, yeah. But this, we, I think it actually speaks to us pretty well. I think... Um, because so is so colloquial in English, but has a kind of deeper root in another language, I think we kind of, I don't know, when you see us tonight, I think we kind of feel that. We hope to present new things in a pretty fun way and in a kind of non-scary fun way, but have some kind of um, deeper essence to what we're doing as well, working on both levels, mm -hmm. you know. And from your very beginnings, you started from, as a group, figuring things out. This is 20 plus years, and now you have a nonprofit with staff, with a board, with Summer Institute, with uh, studio, touring, and 
how did that happen in over 20 years? That's a pretty short time to make such a big organization in, in such a short time in this environment. How did that happen? I have absolutely no idea. <laughs> Um, I, I will say that, I mean, we did have a big vision that, I mean, ultimately the real singular vision was to look at a group like the Kronos Quartet, String Quartet, who is specialized entirely in doing new music, which actually was a great leap of faith for a string quartet because they had so much other repertoire they could have also been playing from the past. We did not have so much other repertoire from the past that we could be playing, but that's why they were so inspiring to us because they just took the leap and said, all contemporary music, commissioning new pieces, full-time quartet, and they had already been doing that for 25 or 30 years by the time we started. There were many other inspirations, but we, we looked to them all the time and they just celebrated their 50th anniversary, so it's super inspiring for us. And so the, the singular vision was kind of full-time percussion quartet, almost entirely new music, with the exception of some John Cage and Steve Reich, Lou Harrison, a few other great composers who really started the percussion revolution. And then, with that in mind, we kind of took it step by step. When we were in our 20s, I don't know, how far can we take this? Let's try it for a while. Oh, some cool concerts are coming up, some people are interested in us. Some of these composers like Steve Reich, who's still alive, who's somebody that we're very close to now and has written music for us, were very encouraging early, early on in our career. They said, yeah, go for it. This should happen. This should, you know, so many people, David Lang, so many other people who, who just said like, this is, it's time for this to exist right now. Go for it. And we just took their encouragement. We took each gig that came and we just kind of kept building it. But then that's where I also say I have no idea because it seems astonishing to me that it has been what it has been because we didn't really know, you know. I would say just to tag on to that, like when I joined the group, uh, this is my 17th year, when I joined the group, it was one of the sort of first things that was imprinted upon me about like the ethos that was driving this ensemble was relationships and how we how you value those, no matter whether it's working with a composer like Natalie Joachim or Angelica Negron like tonight or Shota K. Talaferro. Um, that doesn't stop at whenever the business starts. Like, you know, who, who it is that is your accountant is a friend of yours. And like, if, if you have that relationship, we, don't, we didn't know how to start a summer festival. We were just really good with some fo uh, really good friends with folks who were at universities that, like Princeton. And we said, hey, we'd like to do this crazy thing. They were like, oh, well, here's five people you can call. Here's how I can help. Here's how they can help. And like that sort of snowball effect of just constantly returning to the well of the relationships we have is I think in, due in large part to our, our approach, but it, it is, I think, what feeds us. Like, you know, any weakness that we have, every time we run up against that weakness, I can immediately tag Adam in, and then he can pick up from there and go. And it's like that, I think, sort of seeps into every aspect of what we do. And for, for tonight, for tonight's program, you collaborate with so many artists around the world. And you have a very special program tonight that opens with Angelica Negron's piece, which is a fascinating piece to me that takes the mechanical instruments to another level and it has so many visuals, it's just so incredible. What is, um, can you speak to the, the role of the mechanical instrument in that piece and what is, what is the, how was the creative process? The rehearsal, the working together, coming to that piece? Um, yeah, so you'll, if you all come to the concert, uh, you'll see <laughs> that the, the robots are called the Bricolo Robotic Instrument System, so they're controlled by a computer. Um, and on Helica programs them using MIDI, which is this really common music language. And um, so she kind of, there's a couple of different things that the robots can do, but mostly they just, they have a little arm and they just tap things. So you can put different stuff on top of them and they can tap. And then they, there's another setting where they can um, essentially vibrate at the speed of a pitch. So what you can put in, it's, you can put a, a book or a plate or something on top of it and it'll play a particular pitch that you're looking for on that object. And um, Angelica just uses these all the time in her practice. So um, Angelica grew up in San Juan, Puerto Rico, and um, she played in sort of pop bands there, like reggaeton bands, and she has an ambient group called Arturo and El Barco. And then um, she also studied, was it viola or violin? She, she, she studied classical music there, and she talks a lot about how she always kept those two things very separate in her musical life there. And actually, um, one really cool connection with Angelica is that when she was still living in Puerto Rico, there was an early so percussion album of Jason's music called Amid the Noise, and she found it in a record store there, and she, she says that it sort of completely changed her life as a composer, and actually was part of this process of opening up the idea that, wait a second, I don't have to keep these two sides of my artistic life separate, 
classical music can sound like the music that I'm playing in my reggaeton band or things like that. And so actually, um, we had talked for years and years and years with Angelica. We all just admired her work a lot and wanted to just do a project with her when she was ready to write something and when it was the right time for us to be able to play it at a bunch of places. And just, we always try to be inside the language of a composer. So when we work with a composer, we want to know what do they value in music? What do they care about? And what are the resources they use? So the Bricolo robotic instrument system, she just plays it in her band. So we said, well, that's cool. Do you want to put it in the piece for us too? Yeah, how do you use it in the band? So how do you play with it when it's playing something to you? How do you play back to it? And so she's basically like teaching us how she uses it. Um, and you know, she's not a percussionist, so we hear it and we play back to it differently than she does, but we can kind of get inside her brain a little bit. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And there are certain elements that each movement has, uh, the, the magnetiles for children, the, the pots and pans, and each one of those has a different meaning for her and takes her to her inspiration to write these pieces. How do you connect with those elements? Do you see them as, a, as an instrument or do you connect with them in a similar way that uh, Angelica does. Well, I, I think Adam mentioned some of the older composers we play in, in the beginning of this percussion revolution. John Cage, somebody like John Cage being very important to us. I mean, for him, I think the difference between an object, there, there wasn't really a difference between an object and a musical instrument. Those two things came together. And, and, we, and we joke around a lot. I mean, so many years of our career have been kind of convincing folks that you can make music on anything. And now maybe we're a little bit like, you can make music on anything, but maybe you shouldn't on everything. <laughs> but we're, we're pretty much still in that world of like, you come to our studio in Brooklyn and it's just like objects everywhere, you know, sounds everywhere. Um, when, when Eric was talking about our relationship with Angelica, I mean, I, I first met her, my, my partner played in, Arturo El Barco played in her band, um, but then Angelica would teach um, in Brooklyn to pay her rent, she, she ran these um, classes for kids. So she was my kid's first music teacher and you would show up and sing songs and play sounds on little desk bells and a lot of um, kids' toys. Um, and for a while, I think Angelica got a little uh, frustrated that people would peg her as the kind of, she makes music on kids' toys, you know, because um, she, I don't know, she has a spirit of, she has a wonderfully kind of um, young spirit, and then I think for a long time was just kind of pegged in that world. Um, but seeing the way she's taken those instruments into this piece, which is a, a, a very grown-up piece, so to speak, you know, it's a very um, sophisticated piece in so many ways, but then she brings in, yeah, these, these magnetiles, um, so anybody who's my age that had kids, and I don't know how long magnetiles have been around, probably, I don't know if anybody has forever, right? <laughs> so like, you know, um, we all know what it's like to be on the floor with your kid putting together those magnetiles. Um, and so the idea that you can put all different objects on top of this bricolo and get different sounds, one really cool thing about the magnetiles is that as you build them up, that sound changes a little bit because what's being resonated is changing. And especially when you close it, there's a big difference between it being open and closed. Um, and so she had a really fun time playing off of that. Um, but the, the pots and pans, the, the, what's now the last movement, it was the second one she wrote for us, but the last movement are these pots and pans that she cooks with. The, the first one she brought in was just her kind of soup pot, you know? Um, and it has a wonderful sound when the bricolo hits it, and it has a wonderful sound when you hit the top of it. Um, but I think it really, she was connecting with um, the sounds of the streets in San Juan when she was growing up in that movement, and the sounds that she was hearing um, in a really wonderful way. Um, the first movement is much heavier, um, and it was written right after uh, Hurricane Maria. So it's a much kind of um, heavier thinking back to her family at home who was going through something really tough. Um, and, and she uses these, but, but she always has a way of lightening the, the mood in a certain sense, like, um, because it's also a really fun and beautiful movement. Um, and I don't know how much we should, we should be wrecking the surprises for you all. <laughs> she, she does some really wonderful things in that movement. She, and she deals with color. So much of the time when she's on stage, she's dealing with really beautiful colors. So she's found a way to bring that into all the objects that we play um, in some really fun ways that are more surprising. One thing that I'm, I'm connected to that piece uh, with the, the pots and pans is that she uses the word cacerola. Mm. And in Latin America, there is a, a thing about cacerolazo which is a protest that people do with their pots and pans, Then you bang it, and you go out the street and you bang it, and people do marches and that. And during the pandemic, when in my, in my home country in Peru, people were in lockdown, and we were going through a big political situation, and people were not able to go out to protest, so they did a cacerolazo. 
and they will be uh, banging the pasta pans from the windows and the balconies, and they will um, set up a time, and it was at 6 p.m. every day, and you will, you will hear people banging on the pasta pans. So when I, when I read that work, I said hola. So to us, because this is a, a commonality in Latin America, I was like, oh, wow, that's, that's so interesting. Yeah. Uh, so moving on, your piece, Extremes. Tell me about that piece. Uh, I'm interested in that you made the piece, and I know that the piece is flexible in terms of instrumentation. It can be played with different instrumentation, but uh, the, the one to go is the concert drum. And so you are limiting the space of these four players in this, in this particular, around this instrument. Is, was, uh, is that what you wanted when you wrote the piece? Yeah, I mean, we, we, I guess we do think a lot, and maybe you'll see tonight, I think we think music um, as a pretty communal, it, it's a, we're not just doing it for ourselves, right? We're doing it with an audience in mind. And, and that comes with the visual as well, right? Like when we're spread out and when we're gathered. Um, and when we put together bigger shows, that's a really big way to organize the show, is that when we're, um, yeah, when we're gathered in one place, when we're spread out across the stage, when we're in a line facing the audience and not able to see each other, versus when we can really see each other in, a, in more of an arc or a square, the way you'd see a string quartet play. Um, actually, Angelica has us stand in a way that we've never played music before, kind of in a, a line. I'm just looking at Josh's back, and Adam's looking at my back, a very different kind of way of organizing. So with, with Extremes, I, it, it was part of it to really gather around this drum, um, and it, it is, uh, a lot of the music we make for ourselves um, and a lot of the music I write is uh, flexible instrumentation, meaning um, kind of like I, I we, we were passing through the hall here and seeing a lot of scores that were written and a lot of percussion scores, which was really fun, and a lot of scores that we were involved with. Um, but a lot of time the act of writing music, I think, as a composer is like organizing the notes and organizing the structures and then orchestrating them, choosing what you're gonna play those notes on. And a lot of times I like to just do the first part and then say like, hey, we're a group, let's do the second part together. Or hey, there's another group that's gonna play it. You all do that part on your own and you're gonna come up with something very different than we came up with. And that's kind of, um, that's almost built into our lineage of experimental percussion music. Folks from the beginning like John Cage were really open with that. So we really do it in this way around the drum most often. Um, and of course, then with video, it gets recorded that way, and then a lot of other people do it the same way. Um, but we had a great experience recently. We just went to um, uh, Burkina Faso. We went to Africa for the first time and had a life-changing experience. But we weren't able to play it on a big concert bass drum out there. So each, each time we played, we would find a different way to put the, the different drums together and make that same kind of grouping but on new instruments. And that's something that I think all four of us really, really love to do. Um, but that, that's the way that one came together, at least the, the idea of the instruments. Yeah. Can you talk more about your trip to Africa? That was one of my questions. I'm interested in knowing what you learned, what was, what, what was the interaction over there? One of the, so we went with our colleague, Olivier Tarpaga, who's from Burkina Faso. He also teaches at Princeton. He's uh, uh, the director of African Music Ensembles at Princeton also teaches in the dance department, which is something you learn very quickly about artists in West Africa, which is that very often uh, dance and music are so closely tied as to be virtually inseparable. So it's actually very common to meet somebody who's both a choreographer and dancer and a musician or composer. This is the case with Olivier. So he wrote this piece for us that uses ideas and inspiration from some West African music and instruments, but in some cases is uh, translated over to things that might be more in the contemporary percussion quartet idiom. So for example, uh, the djembe hand drums that they play over there is not an instrument that the four of us have studied extensively. So what Olivier did is he, he uh, we, we together came up with an idea of using amplified tables with little contact microphones on just a wooden table, but he teaches us the way that he practices the djembe, which is sort of like with the heel and the knuckle of his fingers doing doing really fast patterns. So there's a whole movement for us to be playing on an amplified tabletop, but using some kind of West African patterns. One of the other things we did over there is he wrote a movement for us for a five octave concert marimba. But of course the marimba, which is the wooden keyboard instrument with the beautiful low tones on it, is descended originally from the African balafone or bala instrument. So when we went to West Africa, 
They didn't have any five octave marimbas because they were like, we don't need any five octave marimbas because the original thing is here. So we took his piece, which was written for uh, marimba from ideas of balafon and went back to playing it on a balafon. Of course, with his guidance, with him saying, this works, that doesn't quite work for the instrument. He was kind of guiding us the whole way. So we did this kind of full circle thing of like music inspired by the balafon played on a marimba. We go back now in West Africa and we play it on a balafon. And the, the circularity of that kind of cultural exchange, again, with our relationship with him, was beautiful for us on our, on our first trip to West Africa. And, uh, Adam, I remember after the first show, I think maybe the next day we were at breakfast, but I think we had the same response of the feeling that every time we play music here, and, and I think we'll, we'll feel it on some kind of subconscious level in a show like this, in a beautiful hall, chamber music halls, where string quartets play. That's the, the most logical thing any kind of Western European sense of, of classical music is the, it's the string quartet. And we're constantly advocating for ourselves against the idea of the string quartet. It's like, well, you know, how Joseph Haydn, you know, was maybe the, the grandfather of the string quartet. Well, John Cage was that for us. And, and you know, we're, we're constantly comparing ourselves to a string quartet or the techniques we use come from chamber music, even though we may not sound like that, right? But everything we do is kind of in relationship to that lineage. And when we were playing in Benin and Burkina, th that was not present at all. The idea of percussion ensemble being the kind of foundation was, was so crucial and was so kind of um, permeated everything. It was kind of like, oh, we know what you are. What are you going to do with that? Like, is it cool or not? Which, <laughs> you know, like, which also meant that we were very nervous totally, in, a, in a very... Yeah. Uh, we were very honored to be playing all percussion music for West African audience, and they were very serious about listening to what we were doing. Like, okay, like, basically, what do you got, you know? Um, and then we just had a wonderful exchange with people about what we were doing there. Again, Olivier's music was the kind of linchpin in all of it because it was his hometown, it was his area, and people heard patterns in the piece he wrote for us that was from their exact village from right where they were. They were like, cool, you know? So I don't think it could have happened in the same way without the relationship with Olivia. Well, if I could sort of connect it back to talking about Angelica's piece, because thinking about the, the way that Angelica uses each object that she's using in her piece and, and mines it for creative exploration, right? Um, Olivier, and, and we did this sort of with Olivier in the same way that he would say, well, here's the things that I know how to do from my practice but how do those relate to the way that you guys do these things when you're playing them on different in instruments or different objects? And uh, we talk about this all the time, that percussion, I think if you, if you looked up a dictionary definition of percussion, it would probably say uh, anything you hit, scrape, or shake. Uh, but the reality is that we often do things that are not those. You know, we, we play musical saw, or we play whistles, or we play lots of things that don't get hit, struck, or shaken. And the, the real essence of it is just the openness, the, the willingness to be open to um, new things and to figuring something out that maybe you weren't initially planning to do and you weren't comfortable with. So I, I kind of feel like in some ways, you know, what we did with Olivier and what we do with Angelica or what we do when we're learning Jason's piece, they're all part of this same recursive, you know, element of, um, of just like, being in a certain circumstance and maybe making a couple of decisions, like we're gonna use flower pots or we're gonna use one big concert bass drum. And then, okay, now that we've made that one decision, what are all of the options that are left there on the table and who's making the music and how are we involved with it as the performers? So um, it was really, really cool to do that in West Africa. Yeah, I would say for me, coming back, coming back from Africa, the thing that dawned on me as a percussionist, but also just as a musician and a human being, I think you know, Africa was this place, as a drummer, you hear about almost from day one. Um, then, you know, in different parts of the news or whatever, you hear about the way stuff, so, and you, as a, his, you know, you become a little bit of a historian, and you think that it's frozen in time as this thing that's just like, oh, African rhythms are this, and I must do this, and I must have respect for that history. It's like, well, my takeaway coming back is like, yes, have respect for that history, but also it was one of the most musically and artistically progressive places I've ever been in my life. Like, not that there wasn't any respect for the past, but the sacred n nature with which I approached it, like, you can't ever touch, mess with them, they were just kind of like, hi, welcome, come on, like, like, get over yourself for two seconds and get in here and let's mix it up. And so now, like, I think my, and I would, I think I can speak for us, our takeaway is like, trying to view, and not just Africa, this could be India, this could be any other place that we've never been, to, to have respect for the culture and the history, but also not to see it as like, 
a museum that you're about to walk into and, and, and observe as a third party. We were part of it and it was a real honor and it's still, I think we're still trying to tease out what all of this means for us as a percussion group, but also just as a human, how you sort of interact with all that information. In the same spirit of collaboration and working together, I, I read in the program notes about your collaboration with, uh, with uh, Dominic Choraguetelifero about the piece in which you all had to listen to what he presented to you and work from that. So working backwards in a way. Can you talk to that process? Uh, and yes, and it actually it's something we did with um, Olivier's piece as well, which we hadn't mentioned yet, which is something we're doing much more often, which is working with people who compose in an oral process or from an oral tradition. We work with, with them in that process for a very long time, and then at some point in the, along the way we figure out if documentation and notation is appropriate, and if so, how so, and it's all part of this wonderful cultural exchange. So with uh, Show Decay, it was during the pandemic, <laughs> and remote collaboration was all anybody could do. During the pandemic, I think the four of us spent eight months apart without seeing each other, which is, it had never happened before. We had never not been in a room together for that period of time. So. Uh, we asked Show to Kay to just send us something, and he sent us, uh, he composed this three movement piece, which is pretty much exactly what you're gonna hear tonight is what he sent us on these MP3s. He sent it as a track with all these multiple layered parts, and then he sent us what are called the stems, which is the individual layers that were recorded for each one. And he said, here, do what, figure something out with this and let's see what we come to with it. So we initiated a process then of taking those and transcribing them, in some cases transcribing them down to the detail where you slow the track down to like 1 of the speed and go, you know, like you find every little sound. In some cases more, oh, there's a, there's a vibe or a sound. Maybe this is sandpaper. Maybe this breath sound is sandpaper. Maybe it's a little fan blowing. Or So the whole idea was to translate breath art and vocal percussion and beatboxing into physical percussion. So what you're going to see tonight on our end during Show to Case Peace is our physical percussion realizations of everything he sent us um, on those tapes. And actually, like, so I kind of brought it along. Um, uh, but this was maybe three, four years ago now because it was during the pandemic. But for the Library of Congress performance, we actually made um, like a full kind of uh, Western notation score of the piece, which Shodake was excited about and, and wanted to happen. And actually, I, th I believe it's going to go into the collection of the library. Uh, I, I hope. <laughs> um, and, and I mean, Shodake is not on the stage right now, but I feel comfortable speaking for him in saying that. And this happened when we premiered his piece at Carnegie Hall. I do think it is meaningful to him that a score of his piece goes into Library of Congress because I think for his whole life, um, he has believed that the art of beatboxing and vocal percussion should have a, a bigger platform and more of a sense of legitimacy in mainstream culture. And I think to him, uh, doing a project like this, making a score and stuff feels like, a, feels like a step forward along that path. So that's something we're honored uh, to be a part of. Um, but I will stress again that like we just made the score and we made the piece three years ago. So for us, when we're working with somebody who works out of an oral tradition, we try not to go there too quickly because there are a number of um, problems or fallacies that can come into play when a Western trained and Western thinking uh, classical musician immediately starts to translate ideas from an oral tradition into what they already understand. And the way that many Western scholars have dealt with West African music has been plagued with this problem past hundred years or whatever, like, oh, okay, I get it, it's just this. Mm -hmm. And they're like, no, 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 like, you, like, you're not even beginning to understand what they're doing and how they're hearing it. So for our part, there's like this process where we're like, we're in it for a long time before it's like, I think, I feel now like, okay, I can put this into this. And there's like a whole page of explanation here of like, what's on the page is not entirely what it is, but it's our best effort, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, before we open the floor for questions, I know both, four of you are percussionists. Do, you all have like uh, specialties in one specific instrument. What is, and if so, what is it? Well, this is a yeah. This is a funny question. We saw that um, it's so cool to see these scores of pieces written for us in the hallway here. And one of them is this piece by Steve Mackey called "It Is Time." Steve also teaches with us at Princeton, and um, that was maybe the first time. Many pieces for the group before that were written in a way that the composer would say, I want you all to play drums right now, and then I want you all to play wood instruments now, and all to play flower pots now. 
And Steve said, I want to write things that each of you really enjoy playing. So for that piece, we actually got together at his house and he made us grilled chicken. And he said, okay, what is, he went around the table on each one of us. So for Jason plays the last movement of that piece and it's, it's on drum set and it's a crazy, amazing drum set solo. We all play the whole time, but um, each of us is sort of uh, featured in one of the movements. Um, Adam's movement was on a marimba solo and, and with us kind of accompanying him and actually a bunch of little toys on the ground and stuff like that. Josh was playing steel pans and Josh is actually an incredible steel pan virtuoso, which um, maybe is one of the most unusual things in our group. You know, there, there are actually in a very cool way other percussion ensembles that are in the United States and around the world these days, but um, I think we're the only one that has a really amazing steel drummer in our group, and so that's a really cool part of our repertoire. <laughs> and then it got to Thanks, me and Eric. I- Thanks, <laughs> I'll pay you 20 bucks later. <laughs> And that, that was such an awkward conversation for me because I was like, I don't really know. I just really like weird stuff. I, and I, I told Steve a bunch of weird sounds that I was just excited about. So we have this, um, this thing called an SD organ in our studio. The, there's sort of these little um, reed bellows organs that people used to have before folks could have an upright piano in their house. This company, SD from Vermont, would make these bellows organs. And, and we worked with the people at that company for a residency we did in Vermont, and so they gave us two of their organs. And I said, I would love to play this in the piece, or, or um, you know, I would love to play these little uh, this metronome thing. And I showed him this thing where you put a metronome on its side and it ticks irregularly. And I kind of brought a bunch of, bunch of crazy ideas. And then he asked me to learn musical saw um, for that piece. So um, I don't know what that makes me. Uh, that that just means that I maybe. Everybody in our group really loves to explore new sounds, and I think I just in that case claimed the mantle of. Okay, give me give me something crazy, and I just, I'll figure but it out. You you are the guy who is willing to sort of get overwhelmed with too many tasks and see if you can do them all. <laughs> like, and that happens with electronics too. And you'll see in Angelica's piece, Eric is playing, but he's also managing all the electronic files and stuff like that. He does that quite a lot. So now it's time. If you have a question? Please raise your hand. Oh, yeah. You mentioned John Cage, um, but um, I. I, back in the 70s, I studied um, electronic music, and one of the people that I studied and did a workshop with was Morton Sabotnik, who was also a contemporary of John Cage, and there was a few others, and wasn't sure if... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I actually think we ran into Morton Sabotnik. Uh, was it when we did the NC thing? Yeah, we played yeah. We, We've met yeah. him before, yeah. Um, when, uh, when there was a big celebration at Carnegie Hall of the... 50th anniversary of this very famous piece of Terry Riley's called In C, and we were so lucky to be a part of that group. And every legendary composer and performer that we knew about came to this big concert. You know, um, I was standing on stage five feet from Philip Glass, and I had never met him before at that point. So he was like, um, and Morton Sabotnik was there. So we, we've been really lucky that a few times we've been called on to be sort of the rhythm section for these big group performances. Uh, anyway, he's a legend, really awesome. So. I loved you. I got to see you at Princeton, um, which was just, I mean, to me, it's a visual extravaganza as well as a sonic cornucopia, or whatever you want to call it. So I, I'm wondering whether the visual um, comes into play and how it comes into play. I mean, from the audience in Princeton, I kind of got an idea that you are um, planning the visuals as well as the sonic experience and um, I was curious about your take on the visual experience, not to be a synesthete, but it all factors I, in. I was yeah. just gonna say, like, I, I was joking with Jason earlier, maybe he could speak to this better, but like, uh, one of the uh, w things that imprinted on me when I first joined the group, um, relationships, but then I th we were at a sound check, and I had just come out of grad school, right? And so I'm like, my music stand is up like <coughs> eye level, and I'm super comfortable, and Jason walks over and he's like, why don't we just go ahead and put that down? And I was like, why? He's like, well, go stand in the third row. And I like went out in the third row, and it's like all you see is just a three square foot music stand. And it's like somebody paid 40 bucks to come see you play, they should be able to see you, which is A, absolutely true, and then B, now I can't see my music, what am I gonna do? <laughs> um, but I think over time, that, that sort of ethos has sort of seeped into every concert we do, like every show, whether it is an educational concert for, for kids, or it's a show at BAM, or Carnegie Hall, or here, like, we're con and there's a show we're touring with Caroline Shaw right now, uh, with some new stuff from a new album, and we're sort of adapting the setup show to show to be like, ah, let's try this here now. Like this looks, ah, that didn't look so good. Like, it is. It's really important to us how you see the show because how you see things is how affects how you hear them, and vice versa. And I think um, little things that are interesting, we want you to be able to to 
see, to be a part of that and to, to see it visually. Uh, so absolutely, and I think all of the colors, like an Angelica's mm -hmm. piece that you'll see tonight, that's all like thought about and specifically uh. like, you know, the white tray towels are like, we did a video shoot. Like, yeah, it's really important to us because it, it is a show that you're coming to see. It's like going to a museum and like, or going to see a gallery opening and they just left all the ladders out. <laughs> you know, you'd like, and they didn't dust the floor. Like, no, it's like you, you really want to just focus on the painting. And I think that ethos is something we think, think long and hard about. So can I ask a follow-up? Because in the analogy with the string quartet, the acoustics of the space matter. And I'm lucky enough to come to a lot of, these Coolidge um, concerts, and I try to position myself in the room depending on where I think the acoustics are going to be. So I'm curious about, in your rehearsal, how you positioned and if you tuned your staging for the acoustics, and where do you think the best spot in the auditorium is well, for us? I knew that's <laughs> where this was going. Let me just say first, you're not going to miss us anywhere you, anywhere you sit. It's a good time to shout out our sound, our sound guy, Nelson Dorado, is going to be at the board. You're going to see a lot of microphones. That doesn't necessarily mean that we think you're not going to hear the percussion instruments, but it all has to do with creating a balance and a mixture because there's so many different kinds of sounds being made. There's a short, high sound, and then there's a low sound, and we find that having a wonderful uh, sound engineer helps to kind of create the blend of the sound. So I'm not sure there's one spot or another that's, that's better, but if you think it's sounding good, um, you can give Nelson credit. If you think it's sounding bad, maybe it's our fault or something. I don't know. <laughs> it's his fault. If it's bad, it's his fault. I would just say, I love, when we walked into the hall, I was telling Claudia that I, I love the raked, the raked seating. It's just really wonderful. So I, I think you don't need to feel like you need to be right up front either, because I think if you, if you sit back a little bit, the speakers are going to take care of you, and having a nice view of everything um, is maybe what it's, a, is what it's about. But this has been a really beautiful space to play. It's really, really nice. Well, thank you so very much. We're so excited to have thank you, you here. Thank you all. Thank you. It just, I just wanted to share with you that they are doing a school performance tomorrow morning. So we have them twice tonight and tomorrow morning. So enjoy the concert tonight and we'll see you in the hall. Thank you. Thanks everybody.